I invite you to stand. Of you my heart has spoken. Seek his face. It is your face, O Lord, that I seek. Hide not your face from me. Psalm 27, verses 8 and 9. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. As we begin to celebrate these sacred mysteries on the second Sunday of Lent, uh, just what a gift it is that to be able to kind of have, hopefully you have your feet underneath you when it comes to this point in Lent. It's been over a week, it's been, I don't know, 10 days, give or take, maybe 11, I'm not good at math, or calendars, but um, at this point, hopefully, we've settled into this place of being able to say, okay, I can be uncomfortable. And that's one of the parts of Lent is we just get the opportunity to be invited into discomfort. I think so many of our lives are marked by this, this pursuit of comfort. And like, if I'm in comfort, I wanna stay in comfort. If something's uncomfortable, I wanna get back to comfort. That's why we have heat and air conditioning. Those are things that are good, they keep us alive. But at the same time, that can condition us away from a thing. You know, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who take it by force. They're taking it by force. And one of the, the, the calls that we have when it comes to Lent is, am I doing violence to myself? And I mean that in the best possible way. I don't mean that in a, in, a, in, a, in a not pot good way. I mean that in the best possible way. Am I taking the kingdom of heaven by force? Am I entering into discomfort so that I can, so I can have Jesus? Now we know this holier is not always, sorry, harder is not always holier. But we also know that the kingdom of heaven is taken by those who are willing to give everything for heaven. Because Jesus himself has given everything for us. And so we approach his cross, we approach his sacrifice, we approach the God who loves us so much, he gave everything for us. And in response, we just say, okay, Lord, in my comfort and in my discomfort, I also give everything back to you out of love. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, you came to call sinners. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord, have mercy. You came to seek and to save the lost. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You live to intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who have commanded us to listen to your beloved Son, be pleased, we pray, to nourish us inwardly by your word, that with spiritual sight made pure, we may rejoice to behold your glory through our Lord, Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we hear from God's word. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God took Abram outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if you can. Just so, he added, shall your descendants be. Abram put his faith in the Lord, who credited it to him as an act of righteousness. He then said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as a possession. O Lord God, he asked, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He answered him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old she-goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these, split them in two, and placed each half opposite the other. But the birds he did not cut up. Birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses, but Abram stayed with them. As the sun was about to set, a trance fell upon Abram, and a deep, terrifying darkness enveloped him. When the sun had set it, and it was dark, there appeared a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, which passed between those pieces. It was on that occasion that the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to, your, saying, to your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. my light and my salvation the Lord is my light and my salvation the Lord is
is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom should I be? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Hear, O oh Lord, the sound of my call. Have pity on me and answer me of you, my heart speaks. You, my glance, see. is my light and my salvation the lord is my light and my salvation your presence O oh lord i seek hide not your face from me do not in anger repel your servant you are my helper Cast not me off. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I believe I shall see the bounty of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Join with others in being imitators of me, brothers and sisters, and observe those who thus conduct themselves, according to the model you have in us. For many, as I have often told you, and now tell you even in tears, conduct themselves as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are occupied with earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we also await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will change our lowly bodies to conform with his glorified body by the power that enables him also to bring all things into subjection to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. While he was praying, his face changed in appearance and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were conversing with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions had been overcome by sleep, but becoming fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As they were about to part from him, Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he did not know what he was saying. 
While he was still speaking, a cloud came and cast a shadow over them, and they became frightened when they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my chosen son. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They fell silent and did not at that time tell anyone what they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I you have a seat. So last week we started uh, a new series throughout the course of this Lent on the seven last words of Jesus because we recognized we, this. We actually talked about this a couple weeks ago that, that words are important, that words, um, words reveal, right? Words disclose what's in our hearts. Um, words can be powerful and last words of people can be even, even more powerful. In fact, in fact, someone's last words can reveal um, in this extreme moment, here's the thing that was in the depths of my heart. So a couple last words. I'm Harriet Tubman. Of course, we all know Harriet Tubman who had the Underground Railroad leading slaves to freedom. Over the course of 10 years, Harriet Tubman freed over uh, 300 plus slaves. As she died in 1913, she was surrounded by people who loved her and they were just singing. And her last words were, swing low, sweet chariot. That sense of like, I just want to go be, be with, with the Lord. Um, John Paul the Great, uh, St. John Paul, uh, his last words were, let me go to the house of the Father. St. Kateri Tekakwitha, she's the first uh, Native American saint um, in history. And her last words were simply just, Jesus, I love you. Same Mother Teresa, her, same, her words, last words were the same. She just kept repeating over and over as she, as she died, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you until she saw him face to face. In fact, St. Teresa of Avila, um, her, her last words, she was more eloquent than all of them because she went on and on. St. Teresa of Avila said, My Lord, it is time for me to move on. May your will be done, O my Lord and my spouse. The hour that I have longed for has come. It is time for me, it is time for us to meet one another. The hour I have longed for has come. It is time for us to meet one another. And you can contrast that with um, actress Joan Crawford. If you know Joan Crawford, was an actress back in the day. At one point, as she was dying, her housekeeper was, was praying just silently over in the corner. And Joan Crawford saw her and her last words were, damn it, don't you dare ask God to help me. So last words reveal something in our hearts. They reveal what's in our hearts. They reveal what we care about. They reveal what we love. And so we've been looking at this, the seven last words of Jesus, that as Jesus is on his cross, what is in his heart? As Jesus is on the cross, his words reveal the depths of his heart. And so last Sunday, the first last word that Jesus revealed about his heart was, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And so the thing that was on his heart was, was mercy. What was on his heart was his father. What was on his heart was his mission. The first last word of Jesus was mercy begged for, was forgiveness offered. And this week, we're going to look at something else. We're going to look at the missing last word. And the second word, second last word of Jesus, what is the missing last word? Because we know the story, right? Uh, Jesus turns to the good thief. The next thing he says on the cross, he, Jesus turns to the, he's, he's crucified between two criminals. They're both thieves. They're both, well, not thieves. They're both criminals. They're both been condemned to death. And to one of them, he turns to them and he says, Amen, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. There's a missing last word. It's important to understand this, this, this word of Jesus is a response. It's a, it's a response to uh, the, the, the thief on, on the cross who is, he's dying, right? Just as Jesus has been scourged and Jesus has been beaten, Jesus has been whipped, Jesus has been mocked and he's carried his cross and nailed to the cross. Here is the thief on his side who also has experienced many of these things and he realizes, I've justly experienced this. This is, this is what I deserved. And he turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And in response to this, Jesus says, Amen, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. I think to understand this, we have to go back to the first reading, we have to go back to the beginning. In the first reading we have in, in uh, Genesis, we have the call of Abram. You know, Abram, Abram's name later becomes Abraham. But God has already, God has already invited, he's already entered into Abram's life and he's already promised him. He's promised him, we hear it in the first reading. Um, we heard that God says, go out and look to the sky. 
count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you'll be. Now, this is amazing um, because if you probably had this pointed out to you before, but when Abram looks at the sky, uh, we don't realize this until you keep reading, it's daytime. And so here is Ab Abram walks outside and God says, count the stars if you can. Like, no, it's impossible to count the stars. Well, we can count one, I guess. Um, but beyond that, there is, there is nothing. Why? Because you can't see any stars. But what happens is Abram challenges God essentially and says, how am I supposed to know? How am I to know that you actually are going to fulfill what you promised to me? And so and I love this because Abram asks the question and God actually answers. God says, okay, great. Get, go for me. Get, go get for me a, a three-year-old heifer, three-year-old she-goat, three-year-old lamb, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abram's like, oh, we're having a barbecue. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> but Abram knows what's going on because in the ancient world, what you would do is if you were going to enter into covenant, enter into a relationship with another tribe, another family, another, another group of people, you would do exactly what God has told Abraham to do or Abram to do. You would get a three-year-old ram, three-year-old she-goat, three-year-old heifer, turtle love, young pigeon, and you do exactly what Abram does. What does he do? He takes these animals and he cuts them right down the middle, like literally cuts them in half. And what happens is he, it's, it's kind of gruesome, right? It's kind of butcher shop-ish. And he splits them apart and makes an aisle down the middle of them. Now, what you would do in the ancient world is then you would walk through that, that mess, right? You'd walk in between these pieces that were cut up. You walk through the, the blood and the organs and the everything inside. So as, and the other party would do that too. You'd both walk through. And as you walked through these parts of the animals that have been split in two, what you're ultimately saying is, let what happened to these animals happen to me if I'm false to this covenant. And I'm giving myself to you that our tribe, our family, our, our, our people, now we're one people, we're one tribe, we're one family. We belong to each other. And if I'm false to this, let what happened to those animals happen to me. That's how you establish a covenant. And God is saying to Abram, you don't know if I can come through on this promise. Well, let's go. The story goes on. It says that the sun was about to set and a deep, terrifying darkness enveloped Abram. This is so important. A deep, terrifying darkness enveloped Abram. We know that when Jesus was on the cross, the sky became black. And there was a deep, terrifying darkness that, that stood over the land. There's, there's, there's something to be afraid of in this moment. Just like in, in Transfiguration, the gospel today, that this cloud comes and it says it casts a shadow of light, uh, but they became frightened. But it also says this, it also says that when Abram was in the cloud, that when uh, the deep, terrifying darkness, that when Simon and and James and John were in the cloud, they became fully awake. And this is one of the things that fear can do. Remember, we talked, had a whole series on fear, that fear isn't always bad. Actually, fear is what keeps us alive. And in these moments, here's Abram, and he, a deep, terrifying darkness envelops him. Even though it's dark, he is fully awake. And here's Peter and James and John. And even though there's this shadow that's overcome them, they are fully awake. Fear has the ability to wake us up. Fear, fear has the ability to jar us out of just kind of a like comfort has the ability to draw us out of just, ah, oh, this is how my life goes. And fear is, fear has the power at times, as I said before, to keep us alive. So what happens is back to the cross. Here's Jesus on the cross. And he remember, he not, not, doesn't just have one thief. There's another criminal uh, who's being crucified with him. And this other criminal says to Jesus, he says, now one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus. He's just making fun of Jesus. He's saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. To which the other thief, we call him Dismas, he has a, in the tradition of the church, the good thief's name is Dismas or Saint Dismas. To which the other thief, the other criminal, it said, the other, however, rebuking him, said in reply, have you no fear of God? For we are, you are subject to the same condemnation. And indeed, we've been condemned justly for the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes. But this man has done nothing criminal. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So here's, here's, here's the one thief. The one thief, if you're the Messiah, save yourself and us. But here's this good thief, this good criminal. His response, aren't you afraid? His response is, have you no fear of God? Like, do you not realize where you are? Basically, here is the thief on the one side of Jesus. He's awake and he knows that he's in need. And this is so important for every one of us. Jesus has already begged for forgiveness. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
He had begged forgiveness for the both, both thieves. He gave, begged forgiveness for everyone who was crucifying him. He begged forgiveness for you and for me. There was forgiveness that was offered. And here's this good thief, here's Dismas, who admitted he knew he wasn't good. He admitted he wasn't good. He admitted he wasn't innocent. He wasn't misunderstood. Both men crucified with Jesus, both of them were loved. But in response, one loved back and one hated. There was forgiveness received and there was forgiveness rejected. And it started with fear that the one thief said, have you no fear of God? What started in fear, then the thief spoke in hope. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he died in love. His hope turned into love, but it started with fear. And this is the thing, it involves telling the truth about his situation and turning to the only one who could help him. I know I've shared this story before, but um, after I graduated college, I uh, became a missionary in Central America. And even though I, I had graduated, um, I'll say this, I had a degree in theology. I was a Catholic missionary. I was working at a Catholic mission. I was going to mass every single day and I hated the Catholic church. There's a lot of reasons for that, but um, the main reason is my own pride. And at one point, there were these two priests down there and they were so good, they were so holy, but I would make fun of them every time they got up to preach. Every time they said anything, I would just like roll my eyes, I'd scoff at them, I'd be behind their backs, be talking about them, as well as other things, right? And at one point, after being down there for maybe a couple months, I got really sick. And at one point, um, I know I've shared this before, but at one point, uh, the priest, who the younger priest, who had this massively long day. Every single day, he just poured himself out. And, and he knew I, that I was a jerk to him. I mean, it wasn't like he didn't notice this. It was like maybe 7.45 p.m. He'd been going all day, and he was tra going across a little dirt alleyway between the church and the rectory to get some rice and beans. And someone ran up to him and said, Father Tony, uh, Mike's really sick. And so Father Tony, this man who knew I did not treat him well, he ran into the church, he grabbed the Holy Communion, got the Holy Oils, and ran over to where I was. And there, I thought, I mean, I remember being delirious. I remember not really, I knew what I was doing. I knew, I was like, wow, Father Tony's here. That's crazy, that's really nice of him. Because I've been treating him like a jerk, but here he is giving me the sacraments. And Father Tony, he said, do you want to go to confession? And I think about this, at that moment, I remember thinking like, this is potentially my deathbed. This is potentially the place where I'm going to die. And he offered me to go to confession, the chance to receive God's mercy. And I was like, oh, I'm good. I'll take the other two things. So you can give me anointing, you can give me Holy Communion. Now, thankfully, thankfully, I just praise the Lord that I got better <laughs> and, uh, and then had a conversion after that. I think God's grace just was ma massively, massively uh, important. Mercy, but here's the thing, mercy was offered but mercy wasn't accepted. I remember years later, I was ordained and I was meeting with my spiritual director. He's a hermit way up north in northern Minnesota. And I told him the story and it wasn't until a couple years later that he brought it back up again. And he said, can I tell you something? I was like, sure. He's like, he said, when you told me that story about when you were in Central America and you got sick and the priest came to your bedside and he offered you to go to confession and you said no. He said, my blood ran cold. I'm like, really? He said, well, yeah. I know that if you would have died in that moment, you would have been lost to God forever. And I didn't realize. I, did, I literally did not realize. But that's exactly what I was doing here. And you no, know, I, whenever I tell that story, people are like, oh, no, no, Father, but you, know, you can't be sure. Like, you know, God understands. Like, God is so merciful. And now I'm realizing, yeah, you're right. I don't know for sure. And yes, God is merciful, but also, he is so merciful that he sent me a priest. Like, on when I thought I was dying, he actually sent a priest to my bedside. And yes, God is merciful because he didn't let me die. And so I know God's merciful. But I also know that forgiveness was offered and forgiveness was rejected. You know, in a side note here, in, in James chapter 3, James writes this, he says, Not many of you should be teachers, my brethren. For if you're a teacher, you'll be liable to a greater judgment. I have to say that that's one of the reasons why I have a, uh, I have kind of no patience for Catholic schools that aren't really Catholic. Like that, that for, for Catholic schools that, that aren't really interested in teaching the truth. I showed up to campus like on fire for my faith. I wanted to follow Jesus. I wanted to know why I believed what I believed. And after four years, my faith was 
broken. And I get, have, I get to take responsibility for that myself, right? I get to say like, with my own pride, yep, yep, there are people who made it through who didn't have their faith shaken like mine was. But at the same time, James was right. Not many of you should be teachers, my brethren, because you'll be liable to a greater judgment. But on my deathbed, I didn't fear God. The good thief, looking at the other, he asked that question, do you not fear God? I just have to, I beg all of us as you're here, please do not consider yourself above fear of the Lord because it has sobered up more people than we like to think. What so often can begin with fear is spoken in love, is spoken in hope and can end in love. The good thief, he be, what began with fear, he spoke in love, he spoke in hope and he died in love. And this is so critical for every single one of us. A deep terrifying darkness, terrifying darkness enveloped Abram. And what did he see? This is the last thing. What happened was at the end of this mess of animals cut up in this aisle made in between, Abram saw a smoking brazier and a burning torch. It was God's presence. And then what happened was God's presence passed through those animals, passed through those people. You know what didn't happen? Abram didn't pass through those animals. He didn't pass through that, that mess. Almost as if God was saying, Abram, I'm passing through for both of us. Almost as if he was saying, Abram, I know what's going to happen. Abram, you and all your descendants and everyone who comes after you, all humanity, you will fail. All of you are making a covenant with, you will be false. And when that day happens, rather than having you torn in two, I'm going to pay the price. I'm walking through for both of us. Because when that day happens, I will let myself be torn apart. So Jesus from the cross, as he's saying, Amen, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. He is saying that as God himself is being torn apart on the cross. And it cost him everything. It started here in this covenant that Abram, God made with Abram, promising him, when you fail, I'll be torn apart. When you're false, I'll be pierced. And forgiveness is offered, but how often is forgiveness received? How rarely is forgiveness received? How often is forgiveness rejected? How often do we stay away from confession? These last words of Jesus are so powerful, but today there's a missing last word. Jesus says, Amen, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. There's a missing last word there. Both men on the cross were loved by Jesus. Both were offered mercy. One received it, one rejected it. Jesus could have said, Amen, I say to you today, you both will be with me in paradise. The missing last word is both. Both men were loved. Both were offered forgiveness. Both were begged for. Jesus died for both. But only one let Jesus love him. Only one let God's mercy change him. Only one confessed his guilt and experienced life. Don't be the one who rejected his mercy, the mercy that Jesus begged for from his Father. Don't be part of the missing last word of Jesus. Mercy begged for and mercy received. I invite you to stand as we profess our faith in this God who has let himself be torn apart for, so we could live. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident in our Father's love for us that he does not abandon us, we approach him now with all of our needs. That all who proclaim the gospel may effectively bring the world to listen to Jesus, the only Savior and Son of God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That as we acknowledge our heavenly citizenship, we may work to be active and effective citizens of our homeland here on earth. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That the poor, the homeless, and the unborn may experience the protection of the God who guided Abraham. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, the distressed, and for all those who have asked for our prayers, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have been called to their eternal reward, especially our relatives and parishioners, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the grace to begin with the fear of the Lord, speak in hope of the Lord's mercy, and die in his love, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We continue our prayer by offering our diocese of Duluth prayer for vocations. Please, I invite you to pray for vocations in your diocese as well. Almighty Father, we beg you for an increase in religious vocations and holy marriages in our diocese. Help us to be generous in our response to your call. Choose from our homes those who are needed for your work and strengthen us with the courage to say yes and to follow you. Help us as a diocese, as a parish, as families. Encourage and foster vocations to the priesthood permanent diaconate, and consecrated life. We commend our prayers to our patroness, Mary, Queen of the Rosary, and ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Once again, as we approach this altar as part of the virtual front pew, we recognize that we're called to worship the Lord and not only give to the Lord, also to receive from the Lord, to receive his mercy and, and to and be able to be convicted by the fact that God is calling us all to confession. And if your priest <laughs> doesn't have confession available, you can call him and invite him to your home. If you're worried about getting sick, you can just say, Father, stay outside the door. You can, he can go to confession. You can go to confession outside the door. But the reality, of course, is that we come before the Lord and we let him teach us. He offers us his mercy now and we offer him our hearts in response. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands to the praise and glory of his name for our good and good of all his holy church. May this sacrifice, O Lord, we pray, cleanse us of our faults and sanctify your faithful in body and in mind for the celebration of the Paschal festivities through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks 
Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For after he had told his disciples of his coming death, on the holy mountain he manifested to them his glory, to show even by the testimony of the law and the prophets that the passion leads to the glory of the resurrection. And so with the powers of heaven, we worship you constantly on earth, and before your majesty, without end, we acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all your saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Daniel, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you after passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. 
Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. An act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you, as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Matthew 17, verse 5. Let us pray. As we receive these glorious mysteries, we make thanksgiving to you, O Lord, for allowing us, while still on earth, to be partakers even now of the things of heaven, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle, be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. I invite you to bow down for the blessing. Bless your faithful, we pray, O Lord, with a blessing, blessing that endures forever and keep them faithful to the gospel of your only begotten Son so that they may always desire and at last attain that glory whose beauty he showed in his own body to the amazement of his apostles, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, Et Spes Nostra Salve. A te clamamus, exules filii eve, a te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in ac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, illos tuos, 
Misericorde soculos ad nos converte. Et Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium postende. O oh, Clemens, O oh, Pia, O oh, Dulcis, dear 